In this presentation, we will continue on with our S-Corporation comprehensive problem. We are now in part four, where we're actually going to be entering data into the return, that being data for the balance sheet. We'll be entering it into our tax software, a tax software being into it, owned by the owner of uh, QuickBooks. But it'll be a similar process if you're using other type of software too. We're going to be starting off with the entering of the balance sheet, which will be Schedule L. Here we are in our 1120S. I'm going to enter the numbers now from a trial balance from uh, top to bottom, starting with the balance sheet and then the income statement. The balance sheet will be populated on page four. So page four is our schedule L, which will have our balance sheet. We'll need the beginning balances and the ending balances. So hopefully uh, if this is a continuing client, then we would have the beginning balance kids because we'd roll them forward from our tax software. But if not, then we'd have to enter them. So we'll enter here both the beginning balances and the ending balances. That'll help us to think about how, how these two will relate out as well. Now note that the balance sheet, the schedule L isn't always required. And therefore when you do the data input, however, you kind of want to see it. You want to see the balance sheet to see if everything's being input as you want. So you might in whatever software you're using, try to figure out, well, how can I force the balance sheet to be in place, the schedule L so that I can then see it to see to make sure everything's okay. And then if I don't need to include it in the return, then you can remove it from the return. Here, it's gonna be in the miscellaneous items. So we wanna look at the balance sheet miscellaneous items. And then I can force the balance sheet with these little O's, I mean an override for LeCert. So I wanna override the schedule L or force it or override it. So you gotta be really careful with those overrides because you don't, you don't wanna force things if you don't need to. And this, I'm gonna remove the override at the end. However, I want it to show up now. So that means that when I start to enter the data into the balance sheet, it should then populate and I can you know, basically double check the numbers that we input into the system. So then we're gonna go back to our Excel worksheet. You'll recall that we took the client data and then we, that was a financial statement. We put it into a trial balance format. Now, if we had any adjustments that we needed to make to that data, then we would wanna put it into, into this column and then have the adjusted trial balance. Now we will have one adjustment. We're not gonna go through a lot of adjusting entries because you can look at a, financial accounting course to do the adjusting entries. We're working on the tax return here, but we will have one adjustment that oftentimes uh, will be needed uh, from the tax preparer, and that's gonna be the, the calculation of the depreciation. But right now I'm not gonna add that, and I'm gonna advocate basically a, a system for entering this, this data. What you wanna do, once you have the adjusted trial balance pretty much in place, then you wanna take this information and enter it into the system. And I would argue, make the system the tax return number uh, calculate exactly to what the, what the taxable income number is here. Uh, so we're going to do the balance sheet first and then the income statement, but you want it all to reconcile and then go back in systematically and make any kind of adjustments like M1 adjustments or, or schedule K adjustments. And that might be a little bit unusual. You might, if you see other put people inputting this, they're going to, you'll see, as we go through it, you'll say, well, that's not the correct number at the end. It's an M1 adjustment or it's a K it's a schedule K adjustment. But if you start putting those adjustments in just kind of as you go, you start winging them in there, you're not easily going to be able to reconcile. So our system then is, is to put the balance sheet in exactly as it is here so that I can tie out exactly to what we have, then enter the income statement exactly to what we have here so that we are both in balance and can reconcile to our net income number. Then we start to think about the M1 and schedule uh, K adjustments, and we'll do them in a systematic way so that we one, remain in balance after each step there, because that's the complicated part. And two, we can always reconcile uh, these items as we do those adjustments. If you try to do everything kind of at one time as you go, it's, it's just like if you were to try to enter the unadjusted trial balance as if you're correcting it as you do the data input. You don't want to do that. You want to start with the client's numbers, or this is how I would do it because it's it, you know, it's a lot easier to track where something went wrong this way, especially in a more complicated return. So I'm going to, I want the client's numbers first, and then I want to adjust the client numbers to, to uh, the tax adjustments or any adjusting entries. So to do that, I'm only going to look at one column at a time so we don't confuse ourselves. So I'm actually going to hide all these columns except for the tax column. That's the one we're going to use to do the data input. So I'm going to put my cursor on M to P, let go. I'm going to right click and hide uh, these columns. So now we just have one set of numbers. That'll be the easiest thing to, to basically look at and not strain our eyes too much. Okay, now the balance sheet is obviously up top. So we have the balance sheet up top uh, and, and it goes down to the capital account. So we're just going to take this, we're going to enter it directly into the tax return. 
Now, as far as categorizations go, you want to be consistent. So if you have the prior year return, you can use that return to kind of categorize in a similar fashion. You don't want to make different categories and confuse things. You would like to have the, the consistency. If it's a new return, then you're going to have to figure out, you know, exactly where you want to put or how you want to group some things that might not uh, be really clear to group. So let's take a look at how that will look like. We're going to go up top. We're going to say uh, the balance sheet. Now I'm going to enter the beginning balances uh, after. Let's start with the ending balances because we have those. So cap. Before we note, also note that I'm going to enter the information in. I'm going to have a good amount of data input errors as we go. So if you see that, you say, hey, that's the wrong number. Put it in there. As I go back and forth, we're going to have some errors. And then I'm going to fix those errors when we verify jumping back from Schedule L back to the data input. And that will kind of show you how to verify these items. So there will be some data input problems. I'm going to keep them in place. And then when we do the verification, tying in the ending balance numbers, we'll go back in and adjust those. Cash is up top. Very straightforward, obviously, data input for cash, 110000 The only thing confusing for cash is that you might have multiple cash accounts. And if that's the case, multiple uh, checking accounts, you can then put, I would open this up and put each of them in there individually so that you can tie out each individual number to the subcategory here rather than kind of adding them together and putting one lump number here. So that's the only thing I would recommend there. And then we're going to go to the accounts receivable. That's going to be the 230. So we'll say that's accounts receivable, 230,000. Then we had the allowance, which was 30,000. Now the allowance you'll see here is a contra asset account. So you might say, well, which way should it go in my list in my tax program? If I put the data input as a positive number, is it going to show up as a negative number on the re on the schedule L like it should? Let's check it out. It does. Here it is. Here it's subtracting the the 30. So you're gonna those types of things, which way is it going? Is it adding or subtracting from the data input over to the to the form are less transparent than on an Excel worksheet. We don't really know. And so we have to just test it out and see what, what it's doing. And then we're going to go to the inventory, 50,000 in the inventory. So I got inventory uh, is going to be 50,000. Looks good. Then we have the uh, bonds, which I'm going to put in uh, the U.S. government obligations. I'm going to put it in tax exempt securities. We're going to assume they're tax exempt 42,000. And then we have the investments. So we have the prepaid federal state. Uh, we have the other current assets, which I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say we have investments. I'm on the ending balance side and they were 75,000. And then I'm going to go back down and say that we have property, plant, and equipment, and accumulated depreciation. Now, these are things that often the software will calculate for us, and we're going to enter those into the system up top, and in, in when we have the depreciation, we'll actually enter them in there. But right now, I kinda, I'm going to force it to work right now, and then go back in and enter that into the system. So that's going to be part of our process. We're going to basically override the system now. I'm going to go into building and other assets, and I'm going to say that this was, what did I say it was? I can, it was 100,000. And then I'm going to override the system here, 19,592. I'm going to indicate that in my system over here. I'm going to say, hey, look, these two I'm going to make yellow because I've, I'm going to go back to that and I need to enter them individually what the actual property, plants, and equipment was. But right now, I just want to be able to reconcile it. I want to reconcile it and then go back in and figure out the detail, which is confusing of the actual fixed assets list, which we'll talk a bit about. We won't go into a lot of detail. And then we go with the prop, the um, prepaid assets. That's gonna be another other asset. So I'm gonna go into other asset here and say other current asset prepaid. And that's going to be for 23,000. And I'm gonna say, okay. And then we've got the accounts payable 70,000. So that's gonna be a liability. So now we're in the liability section Accounts payable 70,000. We have the accrued uh, accrued liabilities. So it's going to be in other, other current liabilities. So other current liabilities. I'm going to say accrued liabilities. And it's going to be for 7,000. And I think this top one was oh yeah, 7,000 and 70,000. I was right. Started to doubt myself there. I don't know. And then we're going to 7,000. And then we had the long-term debt, which is going to be 16000 So I got loans to shareholder, mortgage, and long-term debt. I'm going to put the 16000 Now, 
the retained earnings is something we hope will roll over for us. So when we get down here to the retained earnings, we had we had the capital stock, which was uh, the 100,000. But I'm not going to override the retained earnings. Notice it has an O in it because I want that to roll over for us. So the retained earnings should be this amount when we're done. Therefore, we're not going to reconcile right now until I, until I finish the rest of it. Now, the next thing I got to do is enter the beginning balances because I this is the first year we've entered into the system. So I want to enter the prior year balance, these numbers over here. In order to, to see only that, I'm going to hide column B for now. I'm going to select column B uh, by clicking on the top item here and then right click and hide. And now we'll enter the prior year numbers. Now, obviously, these should line up in a similar fashion. We should use similar categories. So the cash was... Uh, 70,000 should line up obviously to the cash. You know, we should have uh, some consistency. The accounts receivable, 240, the allowance, 32. So I'm going to say, all right, we've got the 240,000. We have the 32,000. Then we have the inventory and the bonds. And the inventory is 45, the investments, 75. So let's do, I think those are in the same category. So we're going to go down here. We're going to say the inventory was 45,000 and the prepaid, the prepaid assets were 21,000. All right. And so I'm going to go back over here and say that then we have the inventory and then the bonds are 42,000. So let's go to the bonds. So the bonds we put here are 42,000. And then we have the property, plant and equipment, and accumulated depreciation. So property, plants, and equipment. Again, we're kind of forcing those right now. We're 100,000 and we're at 19,592. Notice these two numbers are the same because we haven't recorded any depreciation in the current year. And so we're going to have to do that kind of adjusting entry. All right. And then we have the prepaid assets and then we have the liabilities which are 68,000 and 6,000. So I'm gonna say here we have the 68,000 and then we have 6,000 here, all right. And then we've got the long-term debt 14. 14 for the long-term debt, 14,000, 100,000 for the capital. And then I am going to force the retained earnings here because this is the first time that we've entered into the system. So we need the beginning balance in, in uh, the retained earnings. So that's going to be here. And that's going to be for the 353408. 353408. Now what I would expect is for the beginning balance, uh, balance sheet to, to reconcile the ending balance to be off until we enter the income. So I'm going to go back up top and I'm going to say, all right, the, be, the beginning balance total, if I go to the bottom line numbers, uh, we've got the total assets 403, 408. If I scroll back over here, it's not lining up. It, sh it should be 541, 408. And part of the problem is a 7,000 in the, in the cash should be 70. So I'm going to go back over and say this cash up top should be 70,000. And there we have that. And then I'm going to go back over to the forms. And now we are at a total of 466,408. It should be the 541,408. Notice these investments are off. So I'm going to go back and fix the investments. I'm going to go back over and say that's an other. And the investments should be, I put in the inventory amount, 75,000. I'm going to close this back out. Let's check it again. And we're going to say this is now at... Uh, 496 408 and it should be 541 408 looks like i'm missing the inventory altogether so let's go back to the inventory which is going to be 45,000. so there we have that and then if i go back to the forms now we're at the 541 408 and if i go back here we're at 541 408 now obviously if you have two screens it's a little bit easier than to jump back and forth and do this data input but Notice how you can kind of, I can verify that number clearly. The balance sheet, beginning balance should be fairly easy for me to verify. And then the ending balance here, five, uh, five, 451, 408. And that should tie out here. So we're at 451, 408. Now, in terms of the balance sheet for the ending balance, 
I can tie out the, the, uh, the assets, which are 49408. And I would expect if I was to add up the assets here, I'm going to add up from here down to the prepaid. And we're at uh, four, we're at 580408. And part of the problem there will be this 10,000 should be 100,000. So I'm going to go back over to the data input and I'm going to put in 100. And so then I can come back over and say, all right, that's going to be the 580408. So if I check this over here, once again, if I add all these up, 580408. So that looks good. Now we can't really verify the bottom line. It's, we're going to be out of balance here on the bottom line. And until we calculate uh, the input in the income statement, it's going to be out of balance. Now we could, you know, check it. I could go back over here and say, well, why don't I force the retained earnings and then I'll take it back out, right? I could say if I force the retained earnings, the ending retained earnings, remember, is all of this. Here's this retained earnings all the way down, which is the 387,408. Or you can get it over here on the balance sheet, which is going to be the retained earnings at the end of the year. I'm going to unhide this. Unhide, which was the uh, 353,408. Or I mean, it's the 387,408. should be the same number for the current year. 387,408. So if I force it over here, we say, okay, I'm going to put in 387408 and then go back to the forms. There we have the 387. Now we're at the 580408 and the 5848. So, so now we're in balance. So what I want to do now is remove that number though, so that we can then calculate it when we enter the, the distributions, which we're going to have to enter and the income, which will then allow us to be in balance. So I'm going to have the beginning balance in balance. I know the retained earnings should roll over and then I'm going to remove the ending balance and, and leave that out of balance. And then uh, as we enter the, the profit and loss statement and the distributions, after that happens, then we should be in balance at that point. And then we'll move on to the M1 adjustments and the Schedule K adjustments.